Okay, yeah, well, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, to our November meeting, Midnight Sun Flycasters. And tonight we're gonna have Steve Lanford talking about um, 40 mile country historical fishing methods and gold rush archeology. span So I think most of you are familiar with the club, but um, Midnight Sun Flycasters have been around in Fairbanks since uh, 1976, kind of interior Alaska's fly fishing organization. And our big goals are to share knowledge, um, kind of teach skills to people who wanna learn how to fly fish and, and just to get together and uh, basically build a fly fishing community in interior Alaska here. And of course we're known for our, our kids camp in the summer um, where uh, kids can come and learn how to, to fly fish, to fly tie and, and get into fly fishing. Um, so a few announcements before we get to uh, introducing our speaker. So we haven't, we, we're, we've got a December meeting that's just tentatively set for December 8th at 6.30 p.m. Um, that's a Wednesday as always, and this one will be virtual as well. We've yet to get a presenter lined up, but uh, there's been some discussion about maybe talking about some whitefish biology, getting a, a fish and game biologist to come and talk about that. Um, but we'll send out an announcement when we know more. And something worth kind of thinking about or considering is like after this December meeting in 2022, um, should we continue our virtual format or maybe switch to in-person? I guess we'll have to kind of see what, how COVID is doing and everything. Maybe we'll send out um, a poll about that. But, you know, if, we, if anybody has any thoughts before we get moving into our presentation today, please do shout out and uh, we're happy to hear uh, input on that. And we're also kind of just holding in a holding pattern for the banquet that we usually do in March and then the kids camp in June. Kind of what um, Torpedo, the kids camp last year was just insurance um, stipulations around COVID. And so we're not sure what that might be this year, um, but we'll, we hope to do something, but we'll, we'll definitely keep people updated on that. But for now, um, those, those events are kind of up in the air. Uh, a few other kind of local um, updates. So I, thought, I saw something pretty interesting. U.S. Army Garrison, Alaska, which is like Fort Wainwright, Fort Greeley, called for public input on access projects for outdoor recreation on Army lands. So if anybody has any ideas um, about, you know, places where you might want to see a boat launch or a trail put in where you can, you know, that might be able to access a new fly fishing location. There's so many army lands around um, Delta Junction and Fairbanks where that might be of interest. So I definitely encourage you to look up this call and, and put in your two cents on that. Like um, if you can see in this picture here, something that popped to mind for me was Pile Driver Slough up by Allison Air Force Base. There's this big section of it where there's not really an upper put in for a float, but it'd be a great um, place to install a little boat launch and then you can add a whole new section of the river to float and it can be good fly fishing for grayling in the spring, as you all know. So that was, you know, I'm sure everybody's got a, something they could think of that they might want to see on army lands that would promote our fly fishing access and uh, in the region, but just wanted to put that out there. Um, so yeah, let's see what Dan just said. He'd like to see in-person meetings starting up again, provided COVID continues to decline. Yeah, I agree. And, um, yeah, maybe we'll send out a poll about this, but another thing to consider is like where we would meet, um, in the past it's been at Denny's, but we might consider, you know, looking at some other places too. Um, I agree. It would be nice to get back to in-person meetings. We, it, do, it does seem like we get a lot more views on our, our, the recordings of our meetings, you know, on YouTube after the fact, which is good. I think we're reaching a lot of audi different audience that way, but it would be nice to see everybody's faces again, for sure. Um, so yeah, have a think about that stuff. And I'm gonna hand it over to Will to introduce uh, today's presenter. Uh, Will. Well, hi everybody, thanks for being here. Um, so I know Steve from his work as a volunteer hunter ed instructor for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. He's been a long time volunteer with that program um, and he's a pretty big hunter and outdoorsman and fisherman as well. Um, so a little bit about his background. Steve retired from the U.S. Navy after 21 years, um, after which he moved to Fairbanks and started his second career um, after graduating at UAF with a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology in 1997. Um, from then, he has 20 years of experience doing archaeology in the 40-mile area of interior Alaska, um, and he specialized in the gold rush period, doing research uh, to become familiar with some information about different groups of people that use the 40-mile drainage for fishing and hunting, and that's what he'll be presenting on today. Um, so today, he'll be looking at a photo series of the Osher Lifelong Learning Presentation um, and covering information about the Upper Tanana people and the Mansfield Lake and 
catch you know, catch them stock catch them stock and hand people of the Yukon River region and the Eagle City of Dawson. So with that, let's open it up for Steve. Cool. And I'm going to get Steve's presentation shared here. Hold on one moment. Everybody see that okay? I can give you the mouse too. So yeah. You can use uh, the... Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to share with people a little bit of knowledge about the 40 mile country. <clears throat> the thing about the 40 mile is it's a drainage that uh, originates in Alaska and actually finishes in Canada on the Yukon. So with that border issue, the history is a little tough to explore at times, but it uh, gives us another group of people's ideas on what the 40 mile is. So why is it known as the 40 mile? Uh, early accounts from Euro American exploration uh, placed the mouth of the river 40 miles downriver from the fur trading post at Fort Reliance. Fort Reliance was located in Canada the fur traders had be, come in from Canada with Hudson's Bay Company down to what we know as Fort Yukon today and established post, and were coming down the Yukon River also. When Alaska was purchased, uh, the 40 mile post, or not the 40 mile post, the uh, Fort Yukon post was determined to be an Alaska territory, US territory, and they were forced to revert back to Canada and Jack McQuiston and some of the other traders moved trading posts upriver, one of them being Fort Reliance. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, on down in the presentation. Now, the 40 mile has a couple of issues. One is, how do you separate the 40 mile river from the town of 40 mile? And Michael Gates, uh, archeologist in Canada suggests, and I follow with him that a one word 40 mile is the river and two words 40 mile is the town site and it looks like we have somebody joining us now if i now in the 40 mile country prior to the euro americans arriving we have two prehistoric groups of people that we can talk about ethnographically that use the 40 mile region. So uh, before we do that, we need to talk about how the people got here to Alaska because they were not present in the new world for a, uh, a long period of time in human history. And they uh, apparently come across uh, from Asia. So if I've done things right, we'll launch into some of that. The 40 mile is situated Eastern uh, Alaska, and again, it crosses the Alaska-Canada border. Fairbanks is highlighted with the red arrow. You will uh, travel down, or down the highway. You'll actually go upstream if you're going to Delta Junction and then turn it to Toke and then come into the 40 Mile River on the Taylor Highway. Historically, this was not the way the river was approached. The river was approached from the Yukon River so I'll be talking pretty much, uh, much of it coming upstream off the Yukon River into the 40 mile country in a lot of cases. The headwaters of the river is at uh, Mount Fairplay, which is 5,300 feet above sea level. And at the river mouth at the Yukon, the elevation is 950 feet uh, above sea level. At the international boundary maps show uh, this level. Now think about the elevation difference with what um, Fairbanks is. International airport is at 400 feet above sea level. This is a country that freezes up early and stays frozen late. And it obviously thaws differently depending on the elevation. So this is going to affect uh, what the people could do on the river if they were trying to use the river. 40 mile region turns out is relatively thin on fish, but rich in other resources.
Uh, so how did the people come to the new world? Again, they came from Siberia, moving across Western Beringia, Central Beringia, and Eastern into what we call Eastern Beringia, which pretty much is what Alaska is today. So it takes some time for all this to happen. People that are familiar with the idea of the people in the new world know that the infamous land bridge is a huge expanse of uh, country. And one of the issues that it happens is we have no idea how many people ever began to come across Beringia. Therefore, finding their camps is um, a real struggle for us. It's not well explored in the 40 mile country up around the red arrow there. Uh, it's, it flows kind of counter to what we anticipate the people used to uh, explore Alaska and maybe even down into the lower 48 coming uh, from the west up the Yukon, following the headwaters down south or maybe going to the Mackenzie and going south or going down the Sitna River to the coast. Having said that, there's also increasing acceptance of the fact that there were people using boats, hopping beach to beach along the ice, maybe, uh, to work down to the New World. So a lot of exploration has been done in eastern Beringia. Uh, you see the star there with Fairbanks, the campus site, Chugwater, Broken Mammoth, Mead, uh, Swan Point. Healy Lake Village will come up again because Healy Lake Village has ties to the 40 mile country. It has a long history behind it. Dixada at uh, Mansfield Lake uh, is an important place for the people that use the 40 mile country. Uh, Gerstle River has some very early sites. Uh, Mount Hayes 146, these uh, Dry Creek, Walker Road, Owl Ridge over on the Nenana, all pointing to people being in Alaska uh, between 10,000 and 14,000 years ago. So when do we see people in the 40 mile? Uh, good question because these sites are often found because of projects by other people uh, that require archaeology. For, for instance, um, the federal monies to support the uh, expansion of the railroad. Before you destroy your history, you need to find it. And that drives a lot of this research. 40 mile country doesn't see a lot of project driven work. Therefore, the projects that happened in the 40 mile have been dealing, in many cases, uh, Bureau of Land Management's uh, Wild and Scenic River corridors. And then the Tanaw Chiefs Conference has uh, uh, Doyon lands out there that have to be worked with. And they all have uh, different priorities on their research. So over the years, there's been a growing accumulation of sites in the 40 mile country. Now remember the 40 mile is flowing almost 90 degrees to what we anticipate the people used. So how did they back into the country or come over the ridge into the country? We don't know. And it turns out that the Bureau of Land Management has located 84 sites in the drainage during surveys. Now, what kind of site is that? That's a hopefully a campsite that has some bone in it or some charcoal that we can uh, get a date from in association with tools uh, with the people because it's really hard to pick up a broken rock that's been turned into a spear point and shake it and say, when did they drop you? It just doesn't work. But with charcoal carbon-14 or bone carbon-14, in association, we may get a, a picture of when that site was used, giving us an idea when people were there. Here on the left, you see a trowel with a gray-green flake on the surface. On the right, you see a, uh, a small box screen with an excavation filled with vegetation likely a semi-subterranean house. On the left bottom, we may have a cache feature. A, we often find these with birch bark lining in them, or we find uh, like on the right-hand side lower, we have uh, 
a form of, of obsidian, which is a, in this case, a moderately good tool material uh, for making sharp cutting things. So this is the kind of thing that is, has been found on the 40 mile country. Here you can see a test pit up on an overlook of the river. You'll see a white band of material down under the dark surface layer. And we'll talk about that because that's uh, an important time marker for us in the 40 mile country. And that is what we call the White River Ash. The Mount Churchill eruptions in the Wrangles over time. Uh, one of them occurred 1900 years ago and a second one at uh, 1250 years ago. This eruption gave us uh, 20 times more ash on the landscape than St. Helens did for those of us of a certain age that remember the eruption of St. Helens in Washington state. So this may have affected the ability of the people to stay on the landscape. If you can imagine all your vegetation covered and dying, your rivers choked with ash, and today it leaves a significant marker on the landscape above and below the ash. It's a, a rule of thumb to date the sites. Are the tools found above that white marker or are they found below that white marker? Here is the 2020 survey. Uh, as you can see, we find historic period material like on the left-hand side, a broken point, uh, an excavation, and uh, a feature on the right-hand side looks like a, uh, another uh, semi-subterranean, oh, excuse me, that is a T anchor for a dredge. That is a dead man anchor where the dredge was uh, cabled off to the shore and able to be moved. The excitement was the new site reported at 13,400 years ago. Uh, so we have people in the er very early years exploring Alaska. And for 84 sites, ranging anything from 100 years ago to this figure, you can see it's a thin knowledge of what happens on the 40 mile by the evidence the people left behind. The Wrangell volcanoes left these two different lobes of ash. And this uh, shows that the 40 mile country gets the north lobe and the uh, Yukon country, if you want to say that, gets the eastern lobe. So these have different timings and different quantities of ash on the landscape. But you can see the um, north lobe really does seem to cover the 40 mile country. And uh, we can thank our friends in Canada for what they have done in the um, research on the Eastern Lobe. We can also thank them for their work at the town of 40 Mile, where the 40 Mile River drains into the Yukon. They have documented human use of that country uh, at uh, 2,300 years ago. It's a major uh, fall, winter, a river crossing for the caribou. And this is where they could accept uh, access caribou along the river at that time. Here's uh, uh, the north lobe of the ash in relation to the 40 mile river. You can see it had a dramatic effect on the country. Yet we cannot really quantify if the people had to leave there or simply hunker down and wait for rain to compact the ash and regrow the things or uh, if they left for a period of time, potentially a hundred years. And we know how a vegetation in the, uh, Alaska resets itself and starts again. And after a hundred years, they may have come back to a very rich landscape that would support caribou. And with the rivers draining out, possibly have fish returning to them. We don't know if we lost the fish. We don't have evidence for that. Again, White River ash in the 40 mile bands in these, um, uh, these test pits, as we call them, they're usually 50 centimeters square. And again, this looking for uh, evidence of tools, evidence of people on the landscape. This is one of the tools used by the people, the earliest people that we know of in the Americas, this atlatl and dart. 
you have a throwing stick, the atlatl, and the large dart. This is a leverage tool. You accelerate that heavier spear to a greater velocity, and it penetrates well into your, your large game. Remember, we think the people may have been uh, hunting uh, step bison, the predecessor of the bison we have at Delta today. One thing they did was they took a uh, tool stone, obsidian or, or chert, and on the left-hand side, you see they shape that stone and then take slivers of that stone and make schick injector blades, if you want to call it that, and inset that either in wood or in uh, uh, antler as cutting edges to increase the uh, lethal effects of that spear. This is an example once in a lifetime find from the Yukon at Alligator Lake. It's 6,000 years old and you'll see it is a complete hunting dart. You have the fletching on the upper left end and coming down over into the pile of uh, now exposed caribou dung. You can see the point is still sinew wrapped on there. This is going to be a piece studied for many years. This was found in uh, Canada at a melting ice patch where caribou have summered, staying away from the bugs. Their um, droppings are now being exposed as that ice patch is melted back. And we can see that people knew that caribou were up there because they hunted them there and occasionally lost a tool or an implement. I know of a um, moccasin found that was 800 years old and quite the find, And it took a lot of conservation to reshape it and show you the, the style of moccasin that it was. I do not have a picture of that. So native groups in the 40 mile country, ethnographically, we have two groups uh, that use the river, the uh, river. Now then, the people we know from the upper Tanana at Tanacross have moved to Tanacross uh, recently. They were at Mansfield Lake between the river and Ketchum Stock. The Healy Lake people have a gorgeous lake there with lots of resources, but they had seasonal camp at Joseph. So we have uh, the people at Mansfield Lake who are going to Ketchum Stock and as far as chicken. On the Yukon side, we have the Han from Dawson and Eagle area using the lower 40 mile. And you see they come quite a ways up the river. So <laughs> it's a real conundrum. We don't have street signs and we don't have property boundaries out there with these people. And then of course, some of the people at Eagle potentially, well, we know they did, they married into people at uh, Mansfield Lake. People from Mansfield Lake had relations in Eagle and in Dawson. So it's a time of sharing on the 40 mile river. So it's very difficult to put a, a boundary on things. The Han are an Athabascan speaking group. They are uh, speak uh, the Han language and they are on the Yukon, the upper Tanana, Athabascan speakers speaking the upper Tanana language. Now then I'm gonna focus on the people a little bit. The, Tanana, uh, the Han people, as you can see in the shaded gray here, uh, over at what we know as Dawson today, uh, uh, they have a number of places, place names there. You see Fort Reliance, which was where Jack McQuiston was when gold was found on the 40 mile country. And he moves down to the 40 mile Nope as a trading post after 1886. You see people at Eagle and David's Village and Charlie's Village downstream on the Candic. This is an area where the people used the Yukon River and they were uh, caribou hunters and users. They were fur trappers and they uh, focused pretty much on salmon, which is gonna be different than some of the others. We have place names and accounts of the groups using the 40 mile. Uh, more recent authors have added information and photographs to reports from earlier accounts. Alexander Murray from Hudson's Bay Company, Lieutenant Swatka of the U.S. Army, Dr. Schmitter of the U.S. Army, 
Robert McKenna, an anthropologist, Cornelius Good, an anthropologist, Catherine McClellan, a Canadian archaeologist. These are all people that provide stuff. Uh, prior to World War II, since then, Han, People of the River by Craig Mishler and William Simone, Hammerstones, A History of the uh, Tronchak uh, Quichen by Helene Dobrowski, and Crow is My Boss by uh, Kenny Thomas Sr. out of Tanacross provides us some more information and ties it back to the earlier history. So let's see what happens next here. Alexander Murray made this sketch of the people of the Han in 1846, 1847. You can see they've already been introduced to European trade goods coming in. They are, uh, have access to firearms and it doesn't show real well, but they were also getting beads and they were trading fur that they had trapped for tea, sugar, flour, and of course the firearms and the gunpowder. Populations uh, from Alexander Murray says 230 men of the Han in four bands. 1977, Elizabeth Andrews says the American side of the uh, border of the Han in 1880 at Charlie's Village and at, at 48 and 106 at David's People. He, she, she did not have a location. 1883, Lieutenant Schwatka, who was serving in the Yukon, estimated 75 Han at Johnny's Village. Cornelius Oddsgood, or not Cornelius, Charles Oddsgood, the anthropologist, estimated the Han at about 500 for the last quarter of the 19th century, total for the home uh, land area. So this is a very thin population on a very large landscape. Here's a sketch of our uh, Han Guichen uh, at Fort Yukon. Uh, the women's dress, the way they carry their children. This is the winter house as sketched. You can see that over the years when those people moved and took the skin covering with them and whatever those uh, wooden ribs had, whatever they took or what got left behind, now almost uh, you know, 150 years later, gonna be really hard to find on the land if it's all been allowed to rot. We do see a shape of the type of sleds they had You'll notice that their dog team is very small. These people have to carry what they have and they have to feed those dogs so they cannot afford large numbers of dogs. What is of interest to many of you is things like the Han and the dip netting. Uh, Schwatka in 1883 talks about coming down the river and seeing this. Uh, this is Johnny's Village, which today would be just uh, upstream of Eagle City. And you see uh, a gentleman in the canoe with a paddle steadying himself and his dip net. So the word is that they could see the riffle of the approaching king and put the net in front of him and scoop him up. This is the dip net that uh, Schwatka illustrated for us. You'll see how it's um, kidney shaped and it's braced with a, a good handle on it. I don't have specifications on uh, the length of the handle, but these people are uh, fishing out of a canoe, sometimes with a spotter on shore. Uh, the Han also used weirs, at least in the Klondike, and used fish traps. And then when they were processing the fish out of the trap, the weir was left open so the fish could go upstream and continue their uh, spawning. They were uh, speared. I don't have a picture of the spear. They used nets uh, also likely a spruce root net. I don't know that. Uh, other people use caribou uh, sinew. Uh, and I also know willow bark twisted uh, twine to make nets. Uh, the net out of roots was used as a seine. So for the fishermen, uh, think about how you uh, same salmon or possibly grayling uh, on the Klondike River or at the mouth of the 40 mile river. There is evidence the town site at 40 mile is at least 2000 years old, long before the discovery of gold in 1886 on the river. 
The Han used both king salmon and chum salmon. The arrival of the fish wheel, one of those Alaskan things, doesn't appear on the Yukon until about 1904, for those that are talking about the fish wheel. It's a change in fishing efficiency, but can still be overwhelmed with catch rate uh, in pulses of fish. It can be damaged in the floodwaters and it can have mechanical failures. Without salmon in the 40 mile river, it is unlikely fish wheels were used uh, on the 40 mile. Uh, but the Han, I'm sure used, I know they used the fish wheel in correct settings of the Yukon River. Personal experience says that there are she fish in the 40 mile country from uh, the kink on the North Fork downstream as far as the Taylor Bridge. I've seen those caught. It's known as a grayling river. I know it has uh, burbot on it. Schwatka reports uh, grayling and burbot on the Yukon. Here is a photo taken uh, about 1900 that the US Army is present at Fort Egbert. And you can see the dip net out in front. If you look at it and on the left, you see the drying salmon. Obviously people are interested in showing uh, the newcomers to the country are interested in seeing how the people on the landscape used it. Where's Fort Egbert? Fort Egbert is uh, adjacent to Eagle City and it was abandoned by, uh, I believe, 1911. I shouldn't say abandoned. The Army withdrew from there and left a Signal Corps detachment that operated a, a telegraph station out of there until uh, I want to say 1928, and I could be wrong on that date. But uh, if you look in the photo here at the top right where the boundary is, you can see Eagle. Fort Egbert is literally adjacent. They used to have a fence dividing Eagle City from Fort Egbert. You can still go there today. Yes, it's still available, facility. yes. And it is a BLM destination for people interested in looking at the history. I'm going to shift focus a little bit, talk about the Upper Tanana people. You see Mansfield Lake pointed out. The people that used the 40 mile drainage originally, for the most part, were at Mansfield Lake. They came over out of the Tanana drainage into the 40 mile drainage using the area up around Ketchum Stock. Talking with a colleague, Ketchum Stock, he believes, is a relatively new place name in the country. Uh, he believes it's Chinook jargon, catching stock. This is where they caught the caribou. So catch them stuck. The people on Healy Lake also came over into the middle fork and they used Joseph. So we have people using the landscape from two directions, Yukon River with Bahan and the Tanana River with the Tanacross people or the Upper Tanana people. National Park Service provides this layout for us to see. Uh, item three there, you have Lake Mansfield in the lower third along the river and all the way up you see uh, the Mosquito Fork of the river and, and uh, they have got a boundary in there and everybody wants to draw a fence line there. Well, we can't draw that fence line. We don't know where those people actually went to. We know they uh, visited everywhere. So, uh, Schwatka notes Tanana people at uh, Dawson area as he's coming down river. So uh, these are fluid, very fluid. This is a form of a house used by the Upper Tanana people. Uh, again, you look at that, it's organic, and over time, that is not going to last on the landscape out there. And think about our fire regimen in Alaska. We, uh, if we have that burned down, it's going to be very hard to find any evidence of that house being there. Here is the winter house, very similar to what we saw with the Han. You see how they cache their equipment up and away from the reach of the dogs. This is a winter scene, of, you know. Captain Farnsworth was with the US Army at the time, has a very large collection of photographs of his time in Alaska. He was at Fort Egbert and at Fort Gibbon at uh, the village of Tanana. They also made use of these caches, this high box cache. Again, you lose it in the fire. Uh, you're not gonna find any evidence of it. 
One of the hopes for an archaeologist is the tools remaining in the area where things were processed around the cache. Now then, we do have a photo, uh, a sketch of the upper Tananal with their cone trap. And uh, this is quite likely split spruce, stone weights, and willow uh, bark to um, lash it together. And this, as you can see, they have some form of weir guiding it, maybe simply a, a weir fence and put the trap in it. And you'll have to see that the, the trap is effective and they can size it for the type of fish that they're uh, seeking. So even the people on the Tanana who really don't have salmon coming as high as Tanacross are catching fish and they're focusing on whitefish. This net is theirs. You'll see it's a different shape than what Schwatka had for the Han. It's very round very deep. And here they point out the weir is of spruce and willow branches and a platform where they can walk out to the opening and this large dip net. Here's a photo from the Park Service showing the size of the weir at uh, Mansfield. If you look in the left side of the photograph, you see the nets laying on the walkway. One of the things they talk about is hunting out there. This is a diagram that out of the book that showed us the fish trap, how people knew to use the wind and check the moose tracks and bounce off the track and work their way around, staying on the downwind of the moose so they could approach it for hunting. Here's a nice photograph uh, of the traditional bow, its arrow, and its draw. Uh, this is a tool used by the people. They were not always fishing. They were uh, hunters of uh, sheep, caribou, moose. Both groups used caribou fences in order to collect large amounts of meat and hides. Some of them were owned by the Han, which come off the Yukon. Some were owned by the Upper Tanana, and some were shared between the groups. Remember I said the... The boundaries were fluid. This gets very confusing as to whose fence is whose. We have some uh, oral histories that help us a little bit. We also have place names from the people. Here's a sketch of a fence uh, from the upper Tanana. This small fence at Log Cabin. This is a place name that we can locate uh, near Ketchumstuck. And they say Chief Isaac had a caribou fence that would trap just part of a uh, trap uh, a mile deep. <laughs> you uh, send caribou against that fence and into that uh, corral, a couple of guys with some arrows and uh, set up, if they can block the gate, they've got a large number of, large amount of meat available to them. And they can choose what they're taking. So, Here's another map from a gentleman who came in with the gold rush, Basil Austin, was an organ builder by trade. So his maps in his book are very detailed and very nice to look at uh, with other details about his uh, gold mining, but he has the 40 mile drainage well drawn. And here at the red arrow, you see his location of a caribou fence right here outside of Ketchum Stock. Uh, Olas Muir in 1935 came in with the U.S. Biological Survey and documented the caribou in the 40 mile country and uh, the Yukon. And this is a photograph he took of a lookout for the caribou fence. You'll notice it's all organic. You have a fire sweep through there, you have lost all evidence. Here's a caribou fence as uh, photographed. Again, all organic. This is uh, miles of fence. This is not a weekend project. This is a season long project with renovations through the years to keep this fence effective. Yet by 1935, after the gold rush, 
the repeating rifle is coming in strongly and people become more individual in their hunting because they can uh, hunt more of the season and take individual animals instead of a communal hunt, which changes things a bit. Here's a corral that's been, you can see is slowly returning to mother earth. Uh, I'm told or in red that caribou were killed and taken out of the corral and the ground cleaned because blood spilled in the corral would uh, be avoided by the incoming caribou. So this was a process that took a lot of traditional ecological knowledge in understanding what the caribou did and where you would process them, when to meet them at the fence. Here is from Olas Muri. The fence is six miles long. I don't think I want to be in on a crew of six people building that fence, much less building this corral, which is 35 feet wide and 510 feet long. Uh, a lot of work, but then these people have no other resource on the uh, in their lifestyle except the fish and the caribou and the moose and the sheep. They can trade furs if they've trapped them, make the journey to the Yukon River to the trading posts, or go all the way to Kinnick on Cook Inlet and trade on the coast there and bring back things like tea kettles and gunpowder and firearms and beads and sugar and tea. So a uh, lot of effort, people are staying pretty local. Now then, as the archeologists would say, how the heck do we know where these fences were? This caribou fence was mapped in 1904 when the army was looking at building a road between Valdez and Eagle. It followed, the survey followed along using the telegraph line that existed with the army at that time. And they only noted the caribou fence where it crossed the planned road. So here at the red arrow, you see that you have a, a caribou fence along the way. You look at the place names on the river and you can place yourself there. Here it says old Indian caribou fence. We see the Mosquito Fork of the 40 Mile River. We see Rock Creek. You can go to that um, current USGS, find Rock Creek. You can see this, the shape of these lagoons next to the red arrow there and go to that site. I've been in the area. I cannot find that fence. But as you see, it only crosses the survey line. We don't know which end of the fence had the corral or which end of the fence was the opening. And that's what I have for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Thanks, Steve. Anybody got anything for Steve? I've got a couple for him, but I'll let the audience jump in first. Cool. So you mentioned hammer stones or Tron Dick. What are those and where were they used? Well, you have to drive those stakes at the river and you have to have a hammer of some sort. And you have what we call a maul, like today's sledgehammer, or you can have a smaller stone for breaking stones, a hammer stone used to shape those rock slivers that you put in your spear. I've heard of it as a uh, hammer stone was something they might have used also to pound in like the weir stakes for, you know, their salmon traps on the river, sure. but that's, you know, just something I read. So I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. Well, it's one, one use of the term. Yeah. And you can also realize that if you're making pemmican and you're um, crushing the dried meat, you have something, have a need for something to crush that meat and break it up so you can uh, uh, mix in the berries and mix in the fat. You, you talked about all the different types of ways they, they took fish. They used dip nets, traps, seines, spears, and different types of, of dip nets or nets. Um, do you know if there was, uh, or do you have evidence of the reasoning behind those different methods, how they were 
Like, are they used in different types of rivers, different areas, or different types of fish, you know? Well, for fishermen in general, they understand the, uh, the life cycle of the fish and know when they uh, are in spawn and know when they travel the migrations. So the people on the Yukon River who have salmon coming upstream can time their life around the arrival of the salmon at Eagle or at uh, today's Dawson. They were actually turning up out of the Yukon into the Klondike River. So there was a fish camp with the Han at the mouth of the river. And knowing how to gather those fish seasonally, they can put that weir in place, put their traps in place, process fish on a regular basis, and yet allow fish to escape. They can dip net it. They can uh, uh, spear it. If, you know, again, some of this is individual work. Some of it is group work. Uh, and then, of course, if you have a plethora of fish, somebody's got to process all that fish and dry it and, and handle it. So you may have to pace your work. Unfortunately, the 40 Mile River is not known for salmon. It's known for grayling. So you have a good possibility they're using traps frequently there. Uh, the fish is conducive to going into a trap. It's small enough you can handle a relatively large trap with 30 or 40 salmon in it, or not salmon, grayling. If you put 30 salmon in a trap, who picks it up? Yeah. Who moves it? So you're gonna to have to choose your methods and means. And like I said, uh, burbot are available. We don't have yet any um, evidence of gouge hooks or something like that for the, the burbot. It's not unlikely, but uh, a gouge hook would be done uh, with organic material, which would then disappear into the soil, quite likely. Can you describe that? That all that is is a uh, double pointed bone piece with a line through it, mm -hmm. fold it back along the line, bait it, and then when the fish swallows it, that turns as a T on the line mm -hmm. and it, it, it can't, uh, can't spit it out. Okay. That fish trap you showed looked like it would be good for bourbon too, where they're swimming up into the current. Yes, I've yeah. seen uh, uh, photographs out at on the Kayakuk on the uh, Hoosley area made with chicken wire that had probably 200 fish in it. Wow. But that wow. trap was six feet in diameter and probably 12 feet long. So, uh, you know, the manpower and the tool, the things needed prehistorically probably would never see a trap that big. Uh, if you're splitting uh, spruce down to uh, pencil sized pieces and lashing them together, there'll be a practical limit to the size of your trap. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're fishing whitefish on Mansfield Lake, fish are moving in the smaller stream. You can put a very dense weir in there, stand on that, that platform. Basically, when the, you see the fish coming, dip net a pulse of them into that big net, set them aside. And while that's being processed or waiting for the next pulse, some fish are gonna go through. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sure the uh, people did not want to take every fish that came through. They had a time and a place to take those fish. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seems it, it's interesting. Like I go dip netting for, you know, for the past couple of years and yeah, it's the same thing where we're waiting for that pulse of fish. And Correct. It's very, very distinct. They're, they, they run together. Um, and there's research now to support that fish move collectively and, and kind of communicate collectively and migrate better when they when they are in a group, um, and then just just the fact that you know we're still using very similar methods today that that they were you know, how many how many years ago is well we don't know how incredible. long ago uh, some of these methods came into being. We do know uh, on the uh, Tanana River, chum salmon were being processed and eaten uh, thirteen thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So as the people came into the new world and explored the habitat, they had to learn how to use those things on the landscape, whether it's the fish, the birds, or the, the today we'd say large game. So there's a question, I think in the chat here from Dan, let's see what he says. Thanks, Steve. Oh, he says, for those who haven't done it, a great float trip to do is on the Yukon River from Dawson to Circle, which goes through the 140 mile obstacle history. 
and and Steve, you probably so you said you floated the forty mile itself. I've time, been so. on the forty mile river. Dan's comment is he's basically passing the mouth of the forty mile country. My presentation, though, I hope to make clear was we were talking about the drainage of forty mile. Yeah. Now, forty mile country, depending on the mining terminology and things, can stretch those boundaries. Yeah. Because uh, Eagle became a supply camp that had to pack things into the 40 mile drainage if you wanted something there, or you came up river from the town of 40 mile, uh, usually with a polling boat in the summertime uh, or over the ice in the winter, bringing supplies into the 40 mile country. Chicken is really the end of the line before World War II with people and things coming off the Yukon River into the 40 mile country. After World War II, the Taylor Highway is built and everybody approaches the 40 mile from its headwaters instead of from its mouth. And that affects people's perception of what the 40 mile country is. It's got a terribly fascinating uh, gold mining history, which I haven't covered. Uh, it obviously affects the native people that were using the landscape, it takes a lot of caribou and moose off the landscape. It interferes with trapping and the people have to come to some accommodation uh, in their lifestyle and what they do when they're simply just flooded with people that they didn't see until beginning in 1886 with the first rush into the 40 mile country and then overwhelmed with the Klondike in 1898, 1896, 1798. Yeah, I so, didn't realize there were so like few numbers of people, you know, a few hundred folks in such a big territory. It's pretty interesting. It's a very, harsh country to live in. And as I pointed out with the, the elevation above what we're used to here at Fairbanks, uh, it's winter is longer and harder than we're used to. So if you're in a semi-subterranean house camped in the 40 mile country, you better have a fairly good stockpile of, of either dried or frozen caribou to help you get by. You'll have some water and you'll have uh, fuel to build a fire, but without food, you're going to have to retreat to a place where you can have that food cached. Uh, lakes are a good place to be with a steady resource of fish in the lake uh, and the timber around that for your, your, uh, your heating. On the Yukon, you have uh, the river itself, you have the driftwood, you have the, the spruce along the rivers, uh, and you basically come off the rivers into the 40 mile country, extract some resources, and, and go back. It's, a, it's called a uh, seasonal round, and there's a, a time and a place, as we're all familiar with in Alaska, in the spring we do this, in the summer we do this, in the fall we do this, and in the winter we do this, and all the time you're getting ready for your next season. Yep, yep. that's true. <clears throat> so you've floated the 40 mile river itself, have you fished it at all? Or And then you also have to go in and out of Canada if you're taking out at Eagle, right? So there's a little bit of stuff you got to do to make sure that you don't changed cross over the, the years with yep. uh, with the 9-11 uh, process uh, the work I did with the Bureau of Land Management we quit going through Canada we would take off the river at the Taylor Highway if we could so that we didn't have to deal with uh, clearance of customs and doing that there is a uh, float available with uh, uh, charterers to go into Joseph and float downstream on the middle fork, join the north fork, join the main stem and take out at the tailor. You can put in at the west fork of the Denison and go down the Denison past uh, Chicken and down to the south fork bridge and take out. You can uh, put in the south fork bridge, and go down to the Taylor Highway Bridge. There are several floats that are well known. Uh, was Karen Jetmar's book uh, provides you some floating information on that. If you float uh, from Joseph downstream to the Taylor Highway, be advised there is a 440 yard portage that is mandatory uh, around the kink because of the way when the miners open that uh, dike in the river and it's now eroding back, you have a pretty substantial fall. You can't negotiate in a boat and you just have to avoid it. But that is eroding upstream away from where the historic opening was originally created. And it's advantageous to not get yourself in trouble out there because 
rescue is going to be horribly expensive when the helicopter has to come and get you because that's the only way I can picture uh, somebody getting out of there in an emergency situation. Uh, you can have a, a lesser emergency, maybe uh, people on the boats with a sprained wrist, a sprained ankle, wrenched knee can just take care of that person and come out. But if it's life threatening, I have, have no idea how you get out except with your in reach, your sat phone, things like that, and call for rescue. And there really are no landing strips for the most part. So you're going to wind up with a helicopter rescue, quite likely. Be careful out there, then. Yeah. Yeah. If so, uh, <clears throat> Brent had a question, but I, I did want to ask yeah. you if you had done any fishing when on your floats down the river. But we can uh, go yeah. to Fred's, which was um, Do you know anything about the recent excavations at Quartz Lake and if those people were part of the 40 mile group? Around Quartz Lake, you're talking middle Tanana people. They may have had relatives and ties to the 40 mile country, but I wouldn't anticipate they were using the 40 mile. That's an awfully long stretch to uh, travel to use the 40 mile. Uh, and Kevin asked the question, of, have I personally fished on there on the 40 mile drainage? I have caught grayling and I have caught she fish on there, but I've always been working on the river and had little time for fishing unless it was at camp. And I did catch a burbot one night, so I know they're in there. I don't know how, how uh, they are in numbers, and I've been told of in the fall, uh, burbot fishing can be pretty good. Just out of curiosity, how big were the sheepish that you caught, just roughly? Uh, 20, 24 inches. Okay, because yeah, there's been some research. There's not a lot, but there's a little research about Yukon River sheepish, and some of them are resident sheepish. They make small migrations, like the ones that we see here in the Tanana and Chena River, um, and some are anadromous. They go all the way out to the ocean and travel the whole Yukon River like salmon. So I'd be curious to know which which of those are in the 40 mile, or if it's both. I think it'd be resident, knowing about the other populations, but. They, they definitely could travel that far. From their sizes, mm -hmm. I would anticipate it's a resident fish. Mm. And that's just what little limited experience I have. Uh, as one of the guys I worked for for years has said, sounds like a perfect master's project for somebody. Yeah. Uh, if you're a fisheries biologist, fisheries focused person, that may be a great project because you do have road access to get you to some stretches of the river mm. and you could... Uh, reduce your cost on some of your research, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, not for me to speak. I'm not a fish biologist. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of questions out there. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was thinking about while you were talking about this is, are there similarities between, you know, the gold miners, the people who came in in fairly recent history and the indigenous peoples who lived there for a long time? in the way they lived, in their food storage. You talked a little bit about that and their shelter systems. Did they communicate? Did they replicate the, the, um, the methods they used to survive in the harsh environment? Or did they pretty much bring their own? The people that came into the country, the miners, the first wave of miners were experienced people on the landscape. They knew how to, uh, and learn from the native peoples, how to make things like bone butter, uh, boiling the marrow out of the bones mm. and collecting that to replace the butter that they couldn't buy because there was no dairy. Mm -hmm. um, they learned about what we would call uh, banking your log cabin with sod on the lower courses to reduce the cold infiltration to your house. And they did learn about the animals and they traded with the people uh, readily back and forth. But when the Klondike gold rush happens, there are thousands of people coming in, many of them having no outdoors experience, and they overwhelm anything that was happening with the experienced people. And they were guilty of uh, poor marksmanship. Uh, they uh, slaughtered apparently uh, pretty regularly on animals without knowing how to use all of the animal. And that disrupted the uh, native people's abilities to count on the migration doing what it's supposed to because it's been interrupted by other hunters. Uh, you know, so there's, there's some conflict there, yet the native people in their adjustment, they're flexible. 
well, if I can't hunt, maybe I can work for somebody and get enough money to buy what I need. But in their worldview, that's not a proper way to live in what they know. And uh, there's a trade-off in what you can do for yourself. Hmm. And then later in time, when uh, U.S. government starts asserting its authority and demanding uh, children go to school, that changes your lifestyle. Hmm. The fact that you have a telegraph line from Eagle to Valdez that in essence shows people you can get into the country, get out of the country, uh, they're going to interrupt the native peoples on the landscape and what they're doing. And they're going to occasionally, the native peoples of Alaska usually were helpful to the best of their ability. But remember, when their dog team is three dogs because they can't afford to feed anymore, they really don't have a surplus to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a dramatic uh, thing going on there when somebody comes in that needs help and how do you help them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, scarce environment. A scarce environment and there's no, no store to go to, no hardware place to yeah. replace things with. So it's, it's a very lean uh, country in that way. Yet you have this incredible resource that moves through on a pretty regular basis, whether it's the fish coming upstream or moving from the uh, lake down to the river, back to the lake, or the salmon on the Yukon. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of resources and we're guilty of thinking, well, there's all this resource, but you have to process it, you have to take care of it, and you have to store it. Mm -hmm. And storing food like that demands an incredible amount of your time. And you, if you want to trade anything, you're likely to be uh, trading the fur that you could trap. Right. So was food availability the main limiting factor in, do you think, for the populations, the, the indigenous populations there, or is it a combination of those I, things? I, I'm not qualified to even okay. go there, but remember this, those that have been in Alaska long enough to see the winters and think about how much meat it takes to survive a winter mm -hmm. uh, and to get the skins to build your skin house, if that's what you're using, or you're moving into a semi-subterranean type thing and staying warm, you're going to consume a tremendous amount of food. We don't have the fat in the diet mm -hmm. that uh, the Euro Americans can bring in with uh, particularly the butter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fat animals are important, mm -hmm. but you also have to take animals that provide your skins for clothing, which comes at a different season. And so these people have to balance and they have no means of carrying a wagon. They have no, no wheels. Right. Everything is carried by hand. They can't accumulate a large surplus. Therefore, these shared caribou fences uh, where they can meet their uncle or their aunt or their in-law and share across that. So if at home things have gone completely wrong, maybe you have a, a blood tie to mm. somebody that's got food that'll get you through that season that didn't work out, mm. which means you're gonna have to walk and, and move there and move back. There's just not a whole lot of surplus. Yeah. Yeah, one of our speakers last year um, was Randy Brown and he's a biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. He lived out in this, the Yukon region. I think he lived near Kandik. Um, and he talked about, in a se separate from our presentation, he talked about how fat was the limiting thing. You can get as much protein as you want, but when you kill a caribou, there's very little fat. And that if, if you can't get that fat in your diet, you're, you can still waste away eating as much protein as you want. So as they, you know, historical accounts, you can starve to death on rabbits yeah. by not having fat. Yeah. So there it's a, it's a very tough lifestyle out there. And I think in general, the people uh, that survived childhood in all its dangers uh, to young adulthood were, had to be healthy just by surviving. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can't have a whole lot of people on the landscape just you're limited by your lifestyle yeah uh, it, you know, i don't think it's any one thing i think it's the total lifestyle and the country you're on mm -hmm. i did have one more question too about charlie's village is that still out there i've been 
I've been to Candic and I've floated the Eagle, the circle, um, and I've never seen that. I don't village. think you will. Okay. Uh, these, these place names and these clusters of people noted at the time, is, again, it's fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie's Village may have been there for two decades and mm -hmm. is now returned to Mother Earth. So finding these locations, you can go to Schwatka's map where he maps a group of people on the landscape. But anybody who's been in Alaska any length of time knows the river sweeps like a fire hose back and forth. And if you're uh, not making monumental structures on the landscape, you can be erased very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take the organic materials that you lose in a forest fire and places can disappear. Uh, for instance, the uh, gold mining period uh, nation. Yeah. Yeah. Where is nation today? Cabin. Yeah. Where is nation today? What it, was nation? It's How big was nation? Down, it's a broken down cabin with a landslide that's filled with floor. That's the public <laughs> use cabin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the miners that were on the 40 mile country later in time, they left their cabins and are gone away now. And they're re returning to Mother Earth very quickly. Mm -hmm. And 2004, 2005, the fires erased some of those more prominent dried out log remains. So now they're very difficult to find. Uh, metal detector sometimes might help you find the trash. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of country that gets covered in the moss and you may not even notice it there. Yeah. Yeah. I used to guide in this region and just, I was always struck every time I'd go um, at it's such an incredible, you know, you can feel the history there, all the different you know, because it, it's like Eagle, especially, it's kind of a confluence of, you know, the border of Canada and different different peoples interacting with the fort there. It's, you can, it's it's a important place, I think. It's important see, historically Alaska. for Alaska. Yeah. Yet it's a very young history. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, if we want to say with Alexander Murray coming in with the Hudson's Bay Company in 1847, you know, 1947 is 100. We're approaching almost 200 years of history with your American records. Mm -hmm. That's a very short time when you look at the Eastern United States with, uh, you know, the colonies coming in, or if you look at the people in the New World where people are arriving here 10,000 years ago, a group of, uh, let's say, two couples and their kids, their presence on the landscape is going to be very hard to see. And how many of those two couples and their kids groups were here at any one time? Mm. So, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the Bureau of Land Management knows of 85 places yeah. along the river that we can say people left evidence. And now we have one that's truly old out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one out of 100, so to speak, of very early. They, you know, it's going to be hard to find those uh, enough evidence to really make a dot map and say from here to here to here to there and show where the people were. Yeah, well, the longer it sits, the harder it is to find, right? So the older the stuff is. Well, remember our science changes and the more we find, the better we can refine our, our methods and understandings where people did use the landscape. Mm -hmm. I've seen that change in the, the 20 years I've been doing archaeology. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding where these sites are being located and our testing methods are different today mm. so uh you know maybe sometimes it's just the focus when i first started we were doing a whole lot of because of the wild and sink river corridor was new it's management issues uh with the old remains of the cabins were they in trespass on on uh, blm property well when did blm assume responsibility and whose cabins were they had they been abandoned we needed to resolve some of that and the prehistory was assumed to be there but how much time can you look for it when you've got a, a pressing priority and now with the passage of time uh, trips on the river the cabins have been pretty well located occasionally find new something but we have time to look for some of the prehistory and therefore we can uh, add to the knowledge and this is a knowledge not for a particular person it's for the the country mm -hmm. And remember, the Bureau of Land Management has the Wild and Sink River, and not a whole lot 
a large expanse of territory. You have the native corporation lands out there. You have the state of Alaska lands. Their projects may or may not change some of the focus on the use of the land, particularly with uh, today's mining environment, uh, new minerals. A uh, hundred years ago, we were talking pretty much gold, and that was it. Today, if we look at the uh, the others, the nickels and the coppers, and maybe even some silver, that may change the way the land is going to be desired to be used. And we may have surveys go out there and show us a whole bunch of history we know nothing about. It's yet to be discovered. Cool. Any other comments from the audience? We might go ahead and uh, wrap things up. And I really appreciate you coming and talking to us, Steve. I've learned a lot, so. Yeah, thanks. Well, I consider it a privilege to, to be able to talk with people because I've spent a lot of time, uh, first off, uh, learning it and then being able to talk about it and share it with people because it, it's not mine, it's ours. And if somebody has a question that I can answer, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I do have to point out that I, I refer to the Bureau of Land Management. I have been an employee. I'm not, I'm a, a volunteer at this point and I'm sharing what knowledge I've picked up. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great to think about history in this way because a lot of the times we're out fishing, we're out doing stuff, we're busy, we get wrapped up in it. But it's it's good to take a step back and think about you know how much how much else has happened here and mm -hmm. that we're still a part of that. And you always want to think you're like the first person that walked over this hill or yeah. fished this creek, and then you see some <laughs> yeah. artifact, and you're like, dang it, that's somebody else has been here. <laughs> yes, and it, it's also a privilege to make that discovery, and it belongs to, there on the landscape. And if you uh, go to the property owner, they may find out that it's something new for them. And they all spent some effort to learn more about what happened out there. So, you know, that's the infamous leave no trace. Mm -hmm. uh, take your pictures, get a GPS fix, bring it in and ask somebody if you've got a question like uh, anybody know about this cabin or, hey, I found this broken down wagon out there. And unfortunately, in Alaska history, aviation has its mysteries of lost airplanes. And I would certainly encourage anybody that finds something different on the landscape to check with somebody it shouldn't be left behind as a uh and a left un uh, unreported it needs to be reported people may say yes we know about that and thank you for your time and that's only appropriate you know it seems like if you were an advocate of the anthropologist field and if you were trying to keep future anthropologists employed that you would be, you would not agree with their leave no trace. <laughs> As a principle, you would, you would want people to leave stuff for future discoveries. <laughs> now we can launch into that argument too, but remember we would do leave a lot of trace even when we leave no trace. Absolutely. Uh, it's just in a different place. Mm -hmm. uh, if you stop and think about what Fairbanks landfill will look like a hundred years from now, there's a plethora of things can be learned digging through that trash, <laughs> uh, you know. So it'll it'll just be a different way of looking at what the people are doing. And obviously, the human population on the world, the Earth today, is so much bigger than the populations in these uh, drainages, like we're talking about on the Forty Mile. So, mm -hmm. so it goes. But I certainly uh, appreciate the time, and I appreciate the questions that came in, and uh, yeah. I would be willing to talk with somebody else again at another time, even over a cup of coffee with a particular pointed question if need be. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. So I think we'll go. Thank ahead. you, Steve. That was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you, JR. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and conclude the meeting. Remember our next one, I believe I said it was December 8th, uh, speaker to be decided. Um, but we'll have a recording up for this one. And again, thanks a lot, Steve, for coming and talking to us today. Sure. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good night now.